Welcome to the Scoop Board Order. Happy Sunday. Hope you guys are having a great Sunday. Uh, the Lady Buckeyes have had the thrill of victory with the uh, women's hockey team winning a national championship. The agony of defeat with the girls' uh, hoops team suffering a pretty bad loss to Duke at home uh, in the second round as a two seed, two seven seed Duke. Uh, and uh, the NIT is set. Ohio State's going to play Georgia on Tuesday night. A lot of sports going on for the Bucs today. Uh, and of course, the, uh, the coup de grace, the main course, is that the football team looks really, really good. We're going to get into that. Also, a Michigan starter is hitting the transfer portal. Ooh, boy. Who would have ever projected that? Looks like we did. Uh, Carmelo English is jumping into the portal. Is he the last one to enter in? I highly doubt it, so we're going to get into all that. As always, we appreciate you guys. Hope you guys had a great Sunday uh, with your family and friends. A lot of sports going on uh, between college basketball. Ohio State's out of time with the girls' basketball team, girls' hockey team. Pistol team won the national championship uh, again, uh, so... A lot of good stuff going on for the Buckeyes, but most importantly, our team looked really good in the scrimmage yesterday. So we got another update on that uh, on BuckeyeScoop.com. Uh, it's been up for a few hours. If you guys aren't members of BuckeyeScoop.com and you guys really like knowing what's going on inside the Woody Hayes, you guys should join it uh, today because, man, do we have a lot of good information uh, coming out. So I hope you guys uh, jump on uh, jump on the wagon and join at BuckeyeScoop.com because our message board is absolutely insane right now. Uh, it is really a blast. Uh, if you guys enjoy this content, please leave us a like, click subscribe, also click that little alert bell. Uh, we have a ton of good stuff coming uh, this way this month. This will be a really, really good time. April 13th, which is actually next month, we will have our meetup uh, at Buffalo Wild Wings on the corner of Lane and High Street, the day of the spring game, 9 a.m. to 11.30. I will be there. A slew of special guests will be there. Uh, it's going to be a really good time. I'm really looking forward to seeing a lot of you. Um, go ahead and RCP down in uh, the chat in the comments. Let me know if you guys are going to swing by. I'd love to say hi. Love to meet a lot of you. I think we're going to have a huge turnout, so I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of you guys. So that being said, Nevada, Carmelo English is a kid. Um, you know, He's projected to be a starting wide receiver. This, this offense is pretty bare bones at this point with – uh, you know, we saw the pro day that Michigan had last week. A uh, huge number of players participated in it. Obviously, they had a ton of executives and coaches, uh, which is great for the program. But it also shows how big of a talent drain is leaving Michigan. And that's just from the player side, let alone the coaching staff side, which obviously Jim Harbaugh completely raided. Uh, he was back in town wearing his uh, Chargers gear. Uh, again, uh, no love lost there, in my opinion. But uh this was an interesting one with Carmelo English. He, he jumps into the portal, uh, projected start as a four-star kid out of Alabama, a lot of ability. Nevada, is this going to be a trend? Because there's been a lot of rocky uh, seas up north. Uh, the D They're sold for a new D-line coach after they just fired uh, the guy that got the OVI. Uh, what are your thoughts on what will Michigan look like after spring when that second portal window opens up? Well, they're going to look different. Yeah, we've been telling you they're going to look different. They lost that safety to Alabama. They lose English to wherever English was going to end up going. Um, I keep hearing, I've been sharing it with with people in real time, that I feel like there's other guys from Michigan that are going to be leaving. Um, but you highlighted the big thing. You know, Coaching in college football is almost determinative of success. I've said that for years and years. You know, Good coaches can win anywhere, and bad coaches can't win at all. And, and if you have the better coach, you generally win the game in college football. And so you're going from Jim Harbaugh, who, despite all his quirkiness, despite all his bizarreness, had, had won, you know, he won at Stanford. He'd won in the NFL uh, with the 49ers had been into a super bowl uh, comes to Michigan was certainly an experienced coach from an, you know, his, his lineage, his dad, his brother, uh, the Harbaugh family, obviously very, very experienced coaches. And now you're going from him to Sharon Moore and like seven new coaches on the staff. And if you don't think that's going to make an impact, you're crazy. It, it will absolutely make an impact. And, and so when you combine the talent drain of all these fourth and fifth year guys, this was an, a very old team on for Michigan that um, you know lacked a lot of high end talent. Looks like the only first round pick they're going to have is JJ McCarthy, which again is insane to me insane to a lot of people who don't see him as a first round talent. So uh, the Vikings might see him as a top five talent, which is, which is even wilder, but you know, you can, you lose all the guys that they're losing just north through normal NFL attrition. Then the guys that are entering the portal, then the coaching drain, like there's no way 
to, to and then and then a brutal schedule. Throw a brutal schedule on top of that. There's just no way to to look at the smooth seas ahead for Michigan. And we haven't even talked about the, the specter of the NCAA and everything else that's coming down with that. So um, I I think this is the first. This is I shouldn't say the first because we already had the first. This is the continuation of a trend, and they're not done yet. And it will continue on through the second the uh, second transfer portal, and um, I don't know how many it'll be, but it'll be more. I I, I guarantee it'll be more, and I I think Michigan's going to be in for a uh, for a tough twenty four season, and and I'm willing to bet that. I know the over under on wins in Vegas is nine and a half. I'm telling you, bet the end. They have two guaranteed losses in their schedule. They're going to lose to Texas. They're going to lose to Ohio State. So if you're saying they're going to win ten games, that means they're literally going to run the table on every other game. They're going to beat USC. They're going to beat Washington. They're going to beat everybody else. I don't see it. I think this is uh, – I think they're in for hard times, and I think under nine and a half regular season victories for Michigan is easy money. And speaking of easy money, before I go on to the next topic, <laughs> I want to call out my boy, Dagestan Poppy. We were all – last week we were like, guys, look, I don't do this often, but if you're a better, you like betting, UFC, lo- this is the week to load the wagon. We, we had a really good feel on the card. Uh, we, I, I had a feeling it was the time to push all our chips into the table. We published five bets. We went five for five. So unless you don't like money, um, you should have listened and loaded up because uh, you, not, this is a free show on YouTube. And on top of that, we're giving away free money. So um, that that was free. Dagestan Poppy. Uh, if you're not following him on Twitter, then you're doing yourself a disservice because he is the best free handicapper giving out MMA picks. And uh, those were gifts for you guys last night. And I hope you took advantage of it. Yeah, it's uh, it's amazing. He's been on a heater, a major heater. Yeah, the Michigan thing is something that I just think it's really easy to project how this is going to go down. Again, I, I've talked to Dawson about Caleb Downs. When Nick Saban took off, Nick Saban's the greatest safeties coach in the history of football. Uh, all of a sudden, you're not being coached by him anymore. You're being coached by Kalen DeBoer, who's a really, really good head coach. But his defense was atrocious at Washington. So Caleb Downs is like, and his dad, who is a very, very sharp dude, an NFL guy. Uh, you're not going to seek one in on him. He's like, look, I, you know, we got a lot of money on the line here. We could stick around and hope these coaches at Alabama learn how to coach defense. Or we can go to Ohio State, where they have literally – I don't know, like nine returning starters on defense and uh, let's just roll with that. And so uh, I think that's the direction they went, you know, eight, nine, depending on if you want to count Ty Hamilton as a starter or Mike Hall as a starter at D tackle. I think you have uh, uh, kind of a safe situation in Michigan. You know, they've got two really talented defensive tackles that frankly, if they were draft eligible, they had to jump into the, into the draft and they're still there and their D line coach just got arrested and they've got, a new coordinator and I know Wink Martindale is what it is, but he doesn't want to be coaching college football right now. I'm just telling you, he's been a lifelong NFL guy. Uh, you know, had a bad falling out with Brian Dable uh, with the giants last year. So he's down in college. They're paying a lot of money, uh, which is probably why they got him. But you know, I mean, you look around that, that room and it's, they go, well, Johnson, I mean, there's a lot of these guys that if they hit the market, not only could they go to a better situation in terms of the overall team, but they also could go and make a bunch of money in NIL. So, again, it's not just, oh, we're going to jump off the sinking ship that Michigan is. They can make a lot of money, too. And they can go win another national championship if they go to a place like Ohio State, a place like Texas, a place like Georgia. Like, there's there's teams that are on the come up in Michigan. I'm telling you, if I'm if I'm those wide receivers and, you know, if I'm, especially if I'm Colson Level in the tight end, I'm looking around. They've got – they're going to have five new starters on the O-line – which is that's almost that almost never happens in college where you lose all five starters on your line. New starting quarterback, new starting running back. I mean, it is that's tough. I'm just saying. Like, I mean, it's one thing to have all your war horses back. Um, in general, you want to ro- lose maybe two or three O linemen a year in a given year, but losing all five at the same time is almost impossible. Uh, and I think it's gonna be really interesting to see uh what goes on at Michigan. Again, I think they're gonna have massive uh unrest after this portal. Cause I think that a lot of these a lot of these kids are kind of seeing what their new position coaches are like and what do they think of them? Can they coexist with them? Um, you know, if you're the D lineman, like, I don't know, like your D line coach just got fired. You're through two D line coaches in the last, you know, four months. Like, do you want to stick there? Or do you want to go find someone that's got more stability? I mean, cause these guys, basically this is their last year. It's their money year. Colson Loveland is the one that I'm just like, I don't know what he's doing, but 
because uh, the orgy kid's probably going to be the starting quarterback. He's not a thrower. He's a runner. Uh, and if I'm that tight end, man, he's going to get double teamed a lot at Michigan with how, how destitute their, their skill positions are. Um, but something that's not destitute is our skill positions at this point. Nevada, we had another nice scrimmage nugget today. Got another full download on someone that was at practice. They kind of broke everything down as to what was going on. Uh, the situations were, you know, they did the normal uh, 11 on 11 run stuff where they do runs and RPOs versus the defense. And they do some, they did some pass blitz pickup. Then they moved the field. Talk a little bit about some of the guys that stood out yesterday in practice. Uh, obviously, you mentioned Julian Sane yesterday. He really is is killing the game right now. Um, but who are some other guys that stood out uh, from the report that you had? Well, Quinchon Judkins is a guy, you know, we've talked about him. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, if it's possible for a guy to get overlooked only because you have a Trey, a Trey Henderson in the backfield, but Quinchon is absolutely just just turning turning people's heads every single time he steps on the field. But I want to give a special shout out to Chip Kelly because Chip Kelly is running this misdirection stuff that is really hard to defend. It's hard to follow. It's hard to even see who's got the ball. It's kind of like when you're playing the thing where they're like moving the cups and you're trying to figure out where the where the ball is under the cup. That's what they're kind of doing with the ball right now. And when you've got it, when you do that with your backs with your quarterback who, and Will Howard loves to keep it. And when he does, um, a lot of times he's going out, he's going out the back door and, and there's just nobody there, which is either an indictment of our defense or an endorsement of our offense, but it's, it's one or the other, but the chip Kelly offense, the, the misdirection stuff that he's running, especially right now for a guy like Quinshawn Judkins, is just putting him in such good spots. And, um, you know, we've talked about how the defense always runs ahead of the offense at this time. You know, the it's a veteran defense. It's a veteran group. The, the the defensive line, when they go up against the offensive line, you know, they can get theirs when they when they know what's coming, if they know it's a passing thing. And Jack and JT can kind of, you know, tee off on those guys. But the offense with the misdirection is holding their own, doing some really interesting things there. Um, you know, obviously the, the passing game with Julian Sane and Ameka, and uh, JJ Smith, who we've talked about, you know, ad nauseum, uh, you know, are doing great things. But the Chip Kelly offense, you know, we've always kind of we, we've been asking ourselves, what's really going to be the, the hallmark of the Chip Kelly offense? Is it going to be is it going to be cadence? Is it going to be tempo? Um, you know, is it going to be passes to the tight end? Is it going to be guys? What's it going to be? I'm going to tell you right now. I think the word for for 2024 is going to be misdirection because they are working on misdirection plays over and over and over again. And I'm telling you, very, very, very tough to defend. And as a fan, it's it, like I said, it's even hard to follow who's got the ball. And the, and for me, that's uh, that's music to my ears and music to my eyes because I, I thought that we've been way too predictable, way too many loser plays. We're not going to have a lot of loser plays this year. We're not going to be running into mass fronts. You know, I don't know how you're going to mass the front when we've got so many different ways to attack you. And uh, that's the thing that I'm most excited about. And that's the thing I, that's my biggest takeaway from practice yesterday. Yeah, I think it's going to be uh, it's going to be fun to see what he implements in the running game. The running game is something that I thought was stale. And I think that you know not running the quarterback and not doing a ton of misdirection I think is a combo for disaster in the running game. Um, you know, the line obviously could block better, but a lot of it is is when you have skill guys and there's some confusion amongst the defense and magically it's a lot harder to defend. It's a lot like urban when he first got to Florida and the offense he ran, there were guys, there was a lot of motion. There were guys going um, different directions. And all of a sudden it's like, when you got a bunch of guys that are running, you know, four, three uh, going opposite directions. And then you're reading a guy. And so there's like basically three guys that could potentially have the ball. Like if you take a false step as a linebacker, you're torched. And that's like the thing that re was really fun about that offense. And, it wasn't fun to watch because trust me, we were, you know, I was, I got a good look at it at Glendale when we played those guys. And I was like, this offense is incredible. And it wasn't because their players, it's not because they had Derrick Henry and Adrian Peterson and Orlando Pace. I mean, the, the Florida team that shredded us, none of their offensive linemen got drafted. None of them. Most of their skill guys didn't get drafted or they weren't, they weren't NFL dudes. I mean, Percy was obviously. But, you know, the, the running back was Deshaun Wynn, who was an Ohio kid. Just He was just a guy. Chris Leak was their quarterback, who was, you know, he's a Gatorade player of the year, but he didn't play a single snap in the NFL. So he obviously wasn't anywhere near what he was, he was made out to be in, in high school. But 
it worked. And I think that's something that Chip's going to bring. Uh, someone I talked to literally said it was like, you know, you're, you're everyone's kind of just following the the big crowd of people. Like, when you guys watch a game on TV or you watch a game uh, at Ohio Stadium, you see the big mass of people. You see the, the O-line going one way and everything seems to be going one way. And then someone comes like flying out the back door and you're like, oh my God, that was hard. And like, imagine trying to defend that. Like most people are just sitting in the stadium watching that. And you're just like, whoa, that's, that's what Chip does. Like he, he likes to get guys in compromising situations. He likes to formation guys um, where he puts all the receivers into the short side of the field, um, into, into the, the bench, which is like the, on the left hash, like on the left side of the field, he'll put all the receivers over there and then he'll, uh, you know, do a, a motion and bring a guy out the other way. And, and you're just, you're kind of over shifted and there's just nobody home. And he does a lot and a lot of teams try to do that, but the way chip does it is really creative. He'll pitch a guy, the ball, get a guy out on the edge. Uh, and you, 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 I watched a lot of the tape and I'm like, why doesn't everybody do it like that? Cause it seems like it's so much harder to defend, but that's the genius of chip Kelly. He's, he's a true throwback football historian. And he's, I swear to God, some of the stuff he, he runs is like stuff from like the, you know, it's like single wing stuff from the 1920s. And he's like, got that in his playbook because he is, he is a football junkie. And again, I appreciate that in him because when I watch the stuff, I'm like, that is really good stuff. It's really hard to defend and I love that we're going to be the ones doing it as opposed to me just watching it on UCLA's tape saying, man, I wish we did that. <laughs> so, I mean, again, it's different. Like, and Justin Fry can suggest it to Ryan and guys can suggest stuff. But when Chip suggests it, it's his offense now. And he can say, okay, we're going to – guys, this is how we're going to do it now. So I'm excited for him. Uh, I think it's going to make the offensive line much better. Chip Kelly is a very eclectic coach for those of you guys that don't know. I mean, most of you guys know from the, uh, you know, the, the, the lightning offense that he ran out at, in Oregon where he was all speed, but Chip Kelly has coached the offensive line as a position coach. He's coached running backs. He's coached multiple uh, defensive positions. So he's got a really, he's got a much broader knowledge of offense than most coaches. Like, you know, Ryan day, this isn't a fault. This is just kind of what it's been in his career. Like he's coached quarterbacks and been an offensive coordinator. Like, that's it. Brian Hartline has coached wide receivers. Uh, Keenan Bailey has coached, uh, yeah, as an as a as a real coach, tight ends, and then he's an intern for a bunch of positions. But he's like Chip Kelly has literally been an offensive line coach. So that's something I don't think a lot of people realize. So he has more value uh, when it comes to critiquing an offensive line. He's a lot like Kevin Wilson. Like Kevin Wilson's the guy that coached quarterbacks, offensive line, um, kind of coached all over the place. And and I think that that gives you a different perspective when you actually when you're actually the guy signing his name to a room, like the offensive line, as opposed to just being a coordinator who just kind of walks down the hallway and waves at the O-line. Like he's actually in there running the meetings. And, you know, the thing about when you're running those meetings as a position coach, you better know your stuff because especially modern kids, modern kids are really, really sharp and they're really, really smart. And if you don't know it, they will point out a fraud so quick and then they won't trust you. So Chip, uh, he's got a different... Uh, level of education when it comes to offensive football. And again, I think Ryan Day is going to benefit. I think Brian Hartland is going to benefit. I think Keenan Bailey, I think mystery coach X, whoever a running back coach ends up being is going to benefit. So uh, there's a lot of benefit that's going to be going around of Chip Kelly's uh, uh, ascension as our offensive coordinator. So I think that's like the, the thing I'm probably most excited about outside of obviously Will Howard, Caleb Downs, Quinshawn, uh, all of the talent that we've added. We've gotten a bunch of super chats, so we're going to go through these real quick, and then we'll bounce back into some scrimmage stuff. Show of Steel Workshop, the Knife Man, Knife Man Cometh. Uh, thank you for the five. We should be an ultra member. Big thanks to Kirk and Nevada and the Scoop World Order. Y'all rock. It's 556 uh, Central Time in Michigan. Still bites the big one. Show has got a lot of orders from you guys, so I appreciate you guys. I know Devin ordered a sword, and a lot of you guys ordered knives, so thank you for supporting our boy. He is backlogged because of all of the Scoop World Order orders, so I appreciate you. Uh, Nevada, do you need a knife? <laughs> I, I always think, I, I need it. Like I said, it's it's a back scratcher. You, you can cut your food with it. You can use it as a fork. You can eat it with the food. Like, there's all sorts of different things you can do with it. So, you know, multi, multi-tool, and you know, you're always looking for that gift that you want to get somebody. A custom knife is really good. And there's no guy, there's no man that doesn't want a custom knife. I'm just telling you. That's a very cold thing. And 
You, you put Ohio State on it, put Buckeyes on it, put Harbaugh's face on the blade, whatever you want to do on it. And uh, I, I think it's awesome. I love the knife. Uh, I think it's awesome. I appreciate your show, as always. D Sunny, thank you for the five. Did Nevada really have a chance to own the UFC? Wow, we actually talked about this today. Uh, if so, don't feel too bad. I'll wait for a chance to own 20% of the Broncos in a risk free deal. Nevada, it's always a little bit more complicated than uh, this question uh, makes it out to be just because of what had to go into the UFC. But do you care to explain this? Because this was this was fascinating to me, but it's also like one of those things where in reality, I mean, if you're not the Fertitas and you just don't have cash to burn, it's really a tough enterprise to to bring back, basically resurrect it from the dead. But your thoughts on that? Yeah, just quick. I know this is a football show, but just and we don't want to go back. No, nobody wants to hear the Wayback Machine, but there was a guy named Art Davey. If you look at the, the name Art Davey on the original UFC, Ultimate Fighting Champion, like the original, I'm talking about the old school one, like the UFC one. Um, he was like uh, credited, I believe, as like the, the co-creator or, or whatever of the show. And Art worked for me. And Art had come to me when, when the UFC was basically bankrupt um, you know, they were a pay-per-view only, um, kind of, they were, they were not legal. And, and I, they, I think they're only legal on like Indian reservations and they had no state sanctioning. And he'd come to me and said, Hey, do you want to buy the UFC? You, you literally can buy the UFC and the price was going to be, you know, a, a reason it was gonna be like a million dollars. I mean, a reasonable price to buy the UFC, buy the brand, buy everything. And, um, we didn't do it now, as I told Kirk, I'm like, look, the Fertitas bought the UFC and then they probably put $400 million into it for years of sustaining losses and, uh, you know, getting it sanctioned and doing things you know, way beyond that we ever dreamed uh, were the right ways to go or what was needed to be done. So, yeah, we could have bought the brand, but we couldn't have done what they uh, what they ultimately did with it. And, and uh, they've turned it into uh, amazing that they actually created a new sport and have it sanctioned all over the world. And it's, a, it's an absolute cash machine. Right now, multi, multi, multi billion dollar. I think they sold it for five and a half billion. Um, but yeah, yeah, that was uh, that was actually an offer that was made, uh, considered, looked at it, and uh, just d- didn't see the path forward d- to profitability that the Fertitas did. So uh, God bless those guys. They uh, they had the vision. Them and Dana. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a monster, and it's something that's always fun on a Saturday to watch. Uh, uh, Herschel, uh, this being Scoop Off Remember, thanks for the deuce. Kirk, how's your kid doing? Nevada OH. I O. The kids are both actually out of their casts now, which is great. Uh, one got his uh, leg one sawed off a week ago, and then uh, my six year old got his arm cast uh, taken off Friday. So they are back at it. The two year old cannot uh, crawl very good right now because, his, as you can imagine, the muscle in his leg is uh, gelatin. But he's a. Uh, He's getting stronger every day. He's actually starting to motor around really well uh, uh, from a crawling perspective. I think I said crawl. I meant walk. He can't walk yet, but he can walk like three or four steps. Uh, and then he, you know, his, his leg kind of gives out. But uh, they said that's natural and it'll just take. However, they say however long he's out, he's in a cast, which was six weeks, uh, is how long it'll take for him to regain the muscle memory to, to walk. So, you know, we're walking. He's walking every day and, you know, I'm enjoying him not being as mobile, but He's crawling fast, so he'll be back at it. I really appreciate you asking about him, but they are they're doing really well. Paul Lewis, thank you uh for the 50. <laughs> oh man, this is this is something, man. JT Doubters, uh watch the 2015 scum game. JT was a warrior, in my opinion, one of our greatest QBs who still holds records. Well, you'll never get an argument from me on JT. There's people that are dumb that hate JT Barrett, and there's a lot of them. I mean, I defend JT all the time because he couldn't throw, he couldn't do this, he couldn't do that, but he did win a lot, and he would have won a national championship. I know that, you know, me and uh, some people disagree that the only way that we beat Alabama and Oregon is because of Cardell. I was like, well, I mean, I like, I really like Cardell, but JT beat him out in 14, and then he beat him out again in 15. So, I mean, you tell me. I mean, he was a better quarterback both times. And you know, JT, I mean, obviously, Cardo had that amazing run, won the national championship, uh, was a big, strong arm kid, played, in, you know, was in the league for five years or whatever it was. But, you know, JT for a college player was fantastic. And again, it's, he's like 
kind of like like a Tyler Hansbrough or something like you know Tyler Hansbrough was the most dominant one of the most dominant players in the history of North Carolina basketball but he wasn't dominant in the NBA but he's a really good college basketball player and and that's kind of what JT was like JT obviously didn't um it was in the NFL bounced around a little bit um practice squad or whatever uh but he wasn't an NFL guy but he was an incredible college player a lot like I mean like Tommy Frazier like Tommy Frazier was you know Heisman you know Heisman finalist and dominating you know, on one of the, one of the best you know 95 Nebraska is one of the greatest teams in college football history but he wasn't an NFL guy you know so I mean I don't know if Nebraska fans like just crucify Tommy Frazier because he couldn't throw good and 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 JT could throw I mean go look at the, the records and look how many yards he threw for against that good Penn State team in 2017 like I don't know like I mean I go around and around on the JT thing I love JT Barrett he's one of the greatest Buckeyes who's ever lived uh he was dominant in Urban's offense and again all I care about is, do you win? He did. Beat Michigan. Won Big Ten titles. Uh, he's got a national championship ring. Got a lot of individual awards. All Big Ten, whatever you want. Um, but yeah, he's he's a guy that I love. So, you know, again, you can say whatever you want about him. But he's an absolute warrior. Played through severe injuries. Played in excruciating pain. And that always gives you a lot of uh, extra points with me when you uh, nut it up and play when a lot of guys sort of uh, stood down and, and just uh, taking the game off. Nevada, um, Paul says, JT Barrett Doubters watched the 2015 uh, scum game. JT was a warrior, and in his opinion, he's one of our greatest QBs who still holds records. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, look, look I mean, the one stat that's undeniable, because this is not opinion, this is just fact, is JT started in 12 games against top 10 opponents, and he went 9-3. and three. And that's the most wins against top 10 opponents in school. The, 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 the next highest number of wins by a quarterback in, in, is five, and he had nine. So that should tell you all you need to know, but he was a winner. Uh, obviously, he was productive. I mean, his records, that the, I think he holds you know, 100 Big Ten in, in Ohio State records uh, and just a great kid and undefeated against Michigan. So really – I don't really know what else anybody could really say about that other than that, because, you know, he checks every box that you want for a quarterback and uh great kid as well. I, I hope he gets back to the program. I'd love to see him on the coaching staff. That would make me really happy. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I consider him from the running back coaching job. I know people are going to roll their eyes to quarterback. What would he know about it? But coaching running backs is really easy and he's already coaching. You know, he's the assistant quarterbacks coach. Uh, which is kind of like a quality control position for the Detroit Lions who had an incredible offense. So if I could get a guy who has a more diverse skill set than just coaching running backs, i.e. a guy that's got some throwing game stuff and could bring some of Detroit's concepts down here, because he's been up there for a couple of years now, I'd love to hire JT. And I think he's a, a wicked smart dude. Um, I'd, take him, I'd take him over any of the candidates right now. But that's me. Obviously, I'm biased. Uh, we got another super chat that just popped up. Super chat uh, from uh, thanks for the five agent Warfield fishing. Uh, if you have a question, toss that in the chat. I'll have one of the goons send it to me. Appreciate you, my man. But yeah, I I don't know with the running backs thing. You know, you have a you have a, a spot on the staff. It's kind of like tight ends where you could hire somebody who's a really dynamic recruiter, a guy that you could develop. Uh, he doesn't have to be some he doesn't have to be like a chip kelly where he's a savant and he has to lead something like the running backs coach is just really easy i mean you got trey henderson and quinchon Jenkins. like i literally could go coach those guys tomorrow like i could go watch uh a couple of videos and figure out what drills to do and mesh points and uh uh option uh you know if they run some triple option stuff i could teach them their little courses on that like that's not really that hard to do so again i know it's crazy but i'd uh i'd consider because i think eventually jt wants to get back here um, it's all like Kenny G like, you know, Kenny Guyton was a quarterback all through college and he's been a really good wide receivers coach. Now he's up at Wisconsin working for Luke fickle as a wide receivers coach. And he never played receiver, but he learned enough about the throw game and knew enough about the passing game playing quarterback at Ohio state that he, uh, he'd be, uh, in really good shape. Show steel workshop again. Thank you for the five. Appreciate you, brother. Thank you for being an ultra member, uh, watching with currents, custom welding. He's helping with. My order for Jeremy. That's very cool. <laughs> I mean, we got we got you guys get all stuff sort of stuff welded on our show, so that's actually pretty amazing. It's really cool. Like the community is, uh, it's amazing uh, how people come together and how people support each other. So 
Appreciate you guys supporting our guy, Schulf. Well, Nevada, we might as well jump into TJ Alford. TJ, don't call me Tony Alford, um, is a linebacker. He's out of Vero Beach. Let me see if I can get that uh, corrected a little bit. He's a really uh, he's a really good prospect. This is a kid that I think James is going to land. He's committing next week. Uh, goes by TJ. Uh, full name is Tarvos. Vero Beach, Florida, 6'2", 210. Um, he'll probably be 225 when he's here. He'll be a Will Linebacker type guy. Uh, I'll toss his film on here. What do you like about Tarvos Alford? Uh, he's a South Florida guy um, with a lot of projections to Ohio State. Yeah, I think we're getting him. I mean, James is coming out with the big the exclamation point, exclamation point. I don't know if that's about Alford or about somebody else because I know he's been out there you know, kind of cranking on the guys and James is a relentless recruiter, and, and I expect the the dam to start breaking on uh, on players. So uh, this could be one of the first dominoes to fall. I know Ohio State expects him to commit, and um, I think they're getting him. I think they've they've had him for a while. So uh, I mean, great get, you know, great player that they that they like. They love those guys that can run and cover, do lots of different things, versatile guys, and uh, he certainly fits that bill. You know, he's a guy that can play on either side of the ball. Um, and you know, plays special teams, but it does a do it all type of guy in high school. And uh, I got Ohio State's really excited about getting him, and I, and I think they're going to get him next week. Yeah, and these guys are it's funny how linebackers are getting so small because of the game being in so much space now. But yeah, he's good, he's 220 ish, you probably could play at 225, 230. Uh, because the game's all about speed now, it's all about covering space, and the 240 pound, 245 pound guys are gone now. Uh, you got to be light. You got to be quick. And this guy could run to the ball. He can get to the ball. Um, great attitude, uh, infectious kid. Uh, again, I, I love kids here. I mean, this is see, I, I love stuff like this where he doesn't just run around a blocker. He runs through a guy. Yeah, this poor guy. I and mean, this is, this is like Mark Pantone out here in the slot trying to block the kid gets tossed to the dirt, makes the play. Um, I love that. I mean, I think that that's, uh, that's a great play. Obviously yeah, we just watch a highlight tape. You know, these coaches, Generally, when these coaches, uh, when they evaluate these kids, they'll watch uh, the highlight tape, and then they'll watch a couple full game tapes just so you can see kind of the good, the bad, and the ugly. The thing that's that's really beneficial now is that a lot of these games are they're in HD, so a lot of the film is much much clearer. Because you know, again, if you if you don't have the spot shadow on the kid, like like if you're just watching, you know, if, if you're just a coach right now, I mean, you got to figure out like if he's got like a different color shoe or if he's got a different color arm sleeve on or Hopefully he's got like white gloves or something. Cause you gotta, if you're just watching this, and you don't know who's who you can't really see the numbers at all. So I mean, you're just like, that was part of the things so I was like, please wear like a, wear white gloves or a neon yellow sleeve or something. Cause then it was always a lot easier to find it. But this film's pretty clear now. Like some of the film, you know, 10 years ago, you guys can imagine it was 720 P or it was standard def. And it was like, it was miserable trying to, to make the numbers out on the kids. So, you know, once you are watching this game and you figure out, okay, TJ's got on, okay, he's got like the white, he's got like the white shooting sleeve on this arm and a white shooting sleeve on that arm. And, you know, he's got a, he's got an ankle spat on here. Like that's kind of how you have to watch it because again, you can't, you can't see the numbers pre-snap. Like that's the thing is like when there's two linebackers and he's the one with the white shooting sleeve on, it makes it a lot easier to, to determine who's who. Cause I've told you some of the film that we used to watch back in 2012, man, it looked like the Blair Witch Project and it was hard to evaluate guys obviously you know when you're evaluating offensive linemen it's a million times easier because the left tackle is usually the left tackle every single snap or the center is usually the center but like when you're evaluating like a linebacker that can play three different spots basically play will mike or he could be walked out of the slot or he could be like here he's walked up for a for a quarterback sneak he's up in the a gap like this one obviously you can see the number but um it always makes it amusing when you're you're breaking this stuff down but I love the kid's tape. I think he's got a lot of ability. Uh, really, really excited about him. Uh, Nevada, we've got a very good question from our boy Chris Schmidbauer, former king of the Woody Hayes. I'm going to flip this off and put Schmidty up. Chris Schmidbauer, former king of the Woody Hayes Athletic Center. My dude. Happy Sunday with Trey, Quinshawn, and Will Howard. I think OC runs a lot of two-back sets to set up uh, read options. Opposing defense, pick your poison. Who to Keon? Do you agree? 
I mean, I like it. I don't know uh, if you put Quinchon as like the guy who's kind of like the fullback in the first read, and then you have Trey as a pitch guy. I think it'd be interesting. Um, see, I, I think that, you know, with a lot of like the, the triple option stuff, the third guy, a lot of times now is a wide receiver. Uh, he can, you can get it out to in the, in the slot. Um, that was something urban urban used to run triple option. Urban was nuts. He'd run triple option out of an empty set where all there was nobody in the backfield. Is this a shotgun, a quarterback? And then he would motion guys in to run the triple option. And that was just pure misery to go against as a defensive coordinator. And that's the kind of stuff chip likes to do is make, uh, lives miserable for the DCs. But I could see it. I mean, when you have two first round running backs, I mean, you might as well do things to feature them. I think that that's just how, you know, when you're an offensive coordinator and you're trying to figure out how to make your, uh, how to make defenses lose sleep at night, figure out ways to get your best 11 guys on the field. And that might mean two tight ends, three tight ends, three receivers, four receivers, one running back, two running backs. I think that that's what, makes it fun like it's it's not fun when you don't have 11 players that are any good but at ohio state they've got you know they've got four legit wide receivers they've got two legit running backs you know on the verge of three with dallin hayden james people so i'm talking about like two guys that are like all league caliber dudes and then you know you got your tight ends which is the, the probably the worst position group on the team right now um and then you got uh, a running back or excuse me a, a quarterback that can run like will howard so you got a lot of options. You got to figure out how to deploy them best and how to stress the defense and vary what you do. So I'm really excited to see what we do. Because again, I love Will Howard because he's a big, strong dude. He's fast. He was running around yesterday uh, during practice. Um, and, and by running, I mean, you know, they're running read option with them, which again, people that are at practice, they can't tell, was that an actual read option where they were reading the end or is it just a designed quarterback keeper? Um, again, you, you can't, you can never really tell that unless you're in the huddle or you've got the play sheet or, you know, the signals. So, uh, but he was running it. I mean, and again, that's a, a stark contrast, uh, from last year. I know Devin ran some read option stuff last year. Kyle, um, was slower than I am like as a 39 year old. So he didn't really run any read option, but it's going to be exciting to see what these guys get done. Uh, I'm, I'm just really excited to see what chip can do. Uh, Nevada, your thoughts. Chris Schmidbauer asks, with Trey, Quinshawn, and Will Howard, uh, he thinks that OSU will run a lot of two-back sets to set up uh, read options. Uh, do you think that will happen uh, in terms of making the defense have to pick the poison on who to key on? Yeah, I mean, look, what Chip did at UCLA, and I watched a lot of I – mean, UCLA has seen taking over, so I watched a lot of UCLA football for a lot of years. Yeah, Chip, he'd run that triple option stuff, but he would run it – he would sometimes have a tight end – come back in there with the running back. Sometimes he'd have a wide receiver come back in there with the running back. Sometimes he would use two running backs. So I think you'll see a variety of different looks. I think Chip really, you know, I think people, when you see the two backs back there, it, even though it presents different options, it, it almost becomes kind of predictable because you've got the two backs back there. And I think Chip's whole offense and everything he does is predicated up, up, upon the unpredictable and on the stuff that you're just, you're not expecting to see. And, and so you're not sure who to key on. So I think they'll run some of it, but I don't think it'd be as much. I don't think it's going to be as intuitive as you think because Chip, man, he, he is a mad professor. He likes to go against the norm. And the, the, the days of just lining it up and running to a spot or doing things where you're going to be able to tell pre-snap or you're going to be able to go, oh, I know what we're doing. We're going to get that. You, you will not be able to do that this year. I'm just telling you. You won't be able to do it. You may, you may think you're going to be able to do it, but he loves to run variations off that. He loves to show you one look and then give you a different one. So I think it probably won't be as much as as, as you think it will be, um, despite it being tempting to do it with Quinchon and Trey, because uh, like I said, I think I, I think Chip I think Chip will, will have evolved past that. But it, but it's going to be fun when they're out there for sure. Yeah, it's going to be uh, it's going to be really really fun. I'm excited to see what Chip does with this kind of talent. Um, especially in college, obviously he coached the Eagles, he coached the Niners, but he hasn't had, he's never seen a team that's talented. Even his best Oregon teams weren't as talented as this Ohio state team is Herschel. Again, thank you for being all tournaments for the deuce. Any news on new facilities who need to be the best? Well, I mean, I saw <laughs> the projections and the renderings a couple of years ago and 
They haven't done anything. I mean, they they put some more lipstick on the pig. They you know they put in the cafeteria at the Woody Hayes, and they put in a golf simulator and a couple garage doors, a couple ceiling fans on the indoor, but nothing like ultra substantial. Where you're just like, oh wow, we you know this is something that's going to have us compete with the best of the best. Um, because you know the hard part about the Woody Hayes is it's landlocked. Like there's no, there isn't like a big open field somewhere that they could just bulldoze and turned into something because all of the land around it, they turned into uh, the new um, the Shoemaker Center, which is where the Ernie Biggs facility used to be, uh, the Jennings um, and Cavalli Center, which is back where uh, the old apartments used to be. Uh, that's that's right by Jesse Owens now. That's like the wrestling building and uh, girls volleyball. There's just not a lot of land. So, I mean, they're going to have to get rid of that extra practice field which I don't think is a big deal. They have two grass fields, two turf fields. One of the grass fields is going to have to go bye-bye. And I think they're going to have to to build there. Um, I think that that'll probably become where the weight room is. And then they'll flex uh, the weight room space and try to turn that into office meeting rooms. Again, the fallacy of the Woody Hayes as of now is that when it was engineered, it was not engineered to accommodate a second floor, which sounds like the most like Bush league rendering and, and, and architecture you could ever imagine. But that's exactly what I was told. They can't build like a second floor on top of the Woody Hayes. Cause if they could do that, it basically would change everything. Um, because again, it's, it's hard to just totally bulldoze the building, but they did it to the Ernie Biggs and the Ernie Biggs was ancient and old and rotten. And you know, there's a lot of buildings on campus like St. John's and, and St. John's is very nostalgic, but it is a, it is just an absolute money pit when it comes to keeping it running. Uh, and it'd be a great spot to have like a brand new basketball arena. Uh, but again, obviously they got the shot, which is, you know, a, a concert venue. It's not really a, a, a men's basketball arena, but I, um, I don't have any update on it. I know that I think that they're building a women's hockey arena, uh, or skating rink or something. Um, like I said, every, I think every sport in the, out of the 36 that Ohio state has, has gotten a new facility except football in the last 20 years basketball got a new building uh wrestling baseball volleyball um just rattling them off my the you know the, the crew team which for those of you who don't know what crew is that's like you know the, the rowboat team which isn't even a varsity sport they got a new building that's actually incredibly nice and they host uh uh events there and they it's, you can rent it out it's, it's a gorgeous building um a little you know over the top for uh, a crew team but hey it's what it is um Nevada, do you have any updates on a new Woody Hayes? Well, one uh, hockey hasn't hasn't got a new building, so they they have been been suffering the the, the women's hockey building so bad. Two times national champions in three years. They need they need they deserve to get a new building. But I but I digress. Um, no, actually, Ross Bjork. I I I mean, I they've been pitching out to to. Uh, to large potential donors, a thing called Project 100, which is a $100 million renovation to the Woody Hayes. Now, I've assumed that that would involve them going up. Um, I have not heard that they that it's physically impossible. Um, if anything, I've learned from construction and from doing this and having been involved in you know large-scale conduction projects is nothing's impossible if you're willing to put enough money at it. And so um, I would imagine the only way they can go is up unless they were going to go down and um, you know, that may be, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know what they, what they would do with it, but they're trying to raise a hundred million dollars to do whatever they're trying to do. And um, they're pitching that out. They're trying to get some uh, you know, big donors behind the project. I know that's one of Ross's, you know, he, he Ross Bjork is a really smart guy. He realizes that if you're going to activate big, you know, big donors, big money, do it, you've got to go after the big dog. You're not going to be able to do it raising money for crew or for fencing or for something else like that. You need to do it for football. And, uh, you know, football's the, the thing. It's the straw that stirs the drink at the entire university. And um, I, I, I know that his stated, as part of his stump speech right now, is improvements to the Woody, substantial improvements to the Woody Hayes. So we'll see what he comes up with. Yeah, and, and again, this is just according to... Um an agenda for the board of trustees that uh, they are planning to build a new men's and women's uh, hockey team athletic campus. So it says per approval construction would begin June of this year, 24 and would open April of 26. Now I have no idea where that's going to be at on campus. 
Um, but I knew that that was something that uh, one of the donors I talked to said that was like kind of Gene's like last thing that he wanted to sign off on before he rode off to Arizona and retired uh, was was the hockey project, which I'm sitting there and like, God bless, and, you know, and I'm, I'm really happy the girls team won. Obviously, I think it's fantastic. They're a dominating program. They've won two of the last three natties. They lost one. The one they lost in the middle was by one goal. So it, it'll be nice to get them a new building. But football really needs a new building, like really bad. I mean, football, you see how much revenue they drive and uh, the fact that the Woody is what it is. And again, the Woody is, it's very, like if you didn't know any better, you'd think it was one of the best facilities in the country. But when you know like what the best facilities in the country look like, it's kind of, it's kind of like going to like a nice hotel in like, in like, you know, the middle of America and then going to like Dubai. <laughs> You're just like, there's just not, there's just a big, big difference in terms of what like the, the highest end stuff is. And again, I've never been to Dubai, but I've seen it on YouTube. And, you know, like we need like the Georgia level facility. We need the Michigan level facility, A&M. And again, that doesn't guarantee victory. It doesn't. Oh, well, they haven't won any national championships in a while uh, outside of Michigan. But like, you know, their facilities are really nice. And there's a lot of uh, quality of life things that I think uh, would help in recruiting. It would help with the overall uh efficiency of the program like michigan as much as i hate them they have a really nice facility and again there's no reason why we shouldn't have that because we're better than they are um adrian warfield fishing thank you for the 10 appreciate you my man bought tickets to the game is there a community tailgate that i can bring up my wife and myself to also what happened to demarco murray it missed a couple of days haha -ha. um I don't know for Michigan. Michigan is always kind of sketch just because of Thanksgiving. Usually, um, I don't know if it falls on the same time this year, but we'll see when we get closer to that. Again, we're doing the Buffalo Wild Wings thing this year. Um, I usually um, and noon games are tough, man, because I don't. I get down there about two hours before kickoff. I go into the stadium, kind of get set up, whatever. Uh, but I'll see. Uh, remind me closer to the game. Uh, I'd like to do some. I mean, that's why like the spring game, the spring game is really, really nice to have a get together because nobody's stressed out. Nobody's neurotic. Nobody's nervous. Nobody's scared. Uh, I know a lot of people have a lot of different superstitions. I know a lot of people have severe anxiety before the games, especially the Michigan game, especially we've lost the last three years. So um, I'd love to do something where, you know, people get together and uh, I'll see what we, uh, what we can shake down uh, that day. So I think it'd be really fun. Um, the DeMarco Murray thing was interesting because we had very good intel that he wanted the job. Um, and then it looked like he played us and he got a raise and a three-year deal from Oklahoma. Um, it all made sense to me at the time, but you know, the other thing that made sense is if you're DeMarco Murray and you're kind of the hometown hero, if, if he has the right money people behind him and Brent Venables keeps, you know, you know, driving the Titanic into the iceberg like he is right now then there's a chance he could get promoted as the interim head coach and have a chance to be the head coach at Oklahoma. So, you know, again, sometimes, you know, do you go elsewhere and kind of spurn your alma mater where you, you made your hay versus I thought it made a lot of sense from his career development path to go uh, get with Ryan day, get with chip Kelly, learn the throwing game at a really, really high level. Cause again, if you want to be really successful in modern football, know the throwing game the way that Ryan Day knows it. Because that dude will always have a big-time job. Uh, he won't be able to sit around and cry like Tony Alford and say, oh, I might not have a job next year. Like, Ryan will always have a big-time job because of how good he is in the throwing game. Because, you know, it's like being a great sniper. Uh, they're always going to have a spot for you if you're like a – and that's what Ryan is. He's like the best sniper in the world when it comes to that throw game. Uh, and, and I think like if you're DeMarco – I think it's really short sighted that he didn't come learn from Chip Kelly and Ryan Day and sit in that staff room versus the the room that they have in Oklahoma, where frankly they're going nowhere fast. And you know, if if, if uh, Brett Venables doesn't turn it up a little bit, man, they're going to be in trouble. Uh, if not this year, then then next year for sure. Uh, and about it, your thoughts? Um, a Michigan game community tailgate. It's going to be that's going to be a. I don't want to say it's the biggest Michigan game since like since '06, but. It's going to be up there, man. I mean, with, with the guys we have coming back, the seniors we have, uh, and and then just, you know, the the propensity of Michigan beating us the last three years. Like, people want blood. So this will be, you know, this will be uh, a blood frenzy type game for our fan base because they want to kill Michigan in, in the worst way this year. 
uh, with a team that's that we have that looks overpowering on paper uh, and Michigan looks underwhelming on paper. Um, and then also your thoughts on the DeMarco Murray uh, saga. Yeah, no, I think I, I know that we'll have some community. I mean, I think Jay Hat, one of our great posters, is, has a, a, a tailgate that people are going to. And, you know, we'll see about, like you said, the Michigan game is tough because the you know, tensions are running high before that game. But, uh, you know, we'll definitely try to get something together. But I know some people from the community getting together, and we can direct you in the right direction on that. Um, DeMarco, yeah, that was a weird one. It was a weird one. The, the DeMarco one was weird. Um, Stan Drayton was another guy who wanted the job, but, you know, he's got two and a half million. He makes two and a half million dollars at Temple right now. And you can't just, I mean, two and a half million dollars for one year, you can't just walk away from. That's, uh, so he was hoping to, to work out a negotiated buyout, some sort of a settlement. Couldn't work that out. And so I think that one kind of uh, moved on the vine, as it were. And then, you know, now we're in a situation where, it looks like Curtis Looper is the name that you should be looking out for the coach, the running backs coach at uh, Missouri. Um, I've been saying forever and ever and ever with a running backs coach, the number one attribute you have to have is the ability to recruit the deep South and Texas. So you want a guy that's got experience recruiting the, the South or recruiting Texas. Why is that? Because that's where the running backs come from. They come from Florida. They come from the South. They come from Texas. And you know, if, if there's a kid in Ohio, that's a great running back. Ohio State will get him anyway. So a, a guy like you know, Curtis Looper, you know, from Texas, from Sherman, Texas, coached at New Mexico, Oklahoma State, Auburn, TCU, you know, been coaching at Missouri since 2020. Um, and I think he's a guy that Ohio State's got a high level of interest in, and he's got a high level of interest in Ohio State. So that's a name to watch out for. That's that's a deal that could get made. And um I think it would, you know, I, I like Markel Blackwell as well, the, the, the coach that, the former coach of Quinchon Judkins at Ole Miss, and he's coaching at uh, South, South Carolina right now. But I think Curtis Looper is a name you should be paying attention to, primarily because of his Southern recruiting connections, which is the meta when it comes to running back experience. So that's what I got. Yeah, I think it's going to be, uh, it's going to be interesting, but I also, like, I care, but I don't, just because, like, it's one thing when you're dealing with like the Bill O'Brien saga and he's him ha and he ultimately goes to Boston College. Um and on that one, Nevada has Bill O'Brien cleared his desk out yet? Or no. No, no, no. His stuff his stuff is still there. Like according to according to some of the, the local media, he has not cleaned out his desk yet. But no, that was a that's that's a running joke with, with Burke and I right now because we had told you he's cleaning out his desk. He's going, he ain't coming back. And people are like, no, he's his stuff's still there. He's not leaving. And we're like, no, he's gone, guys. He's already gone. So uh yeah, uh no, Bill O'Brien stuff is gone. He has officially left the building. Cause that was one of the greatest ones ever because I'm sitting there, I have just a rock solid source who says, Yeah, yeah, we saw him cleaning his desk out you know in the woody Hayes, and so we're like well yeah i mean i i mean and, and we're like well we don't know what this means but he is cleaning his stuff out of his desk so for all of us that were you know buying our bill o'brien uh fan club you know pins and t-shirts like might want to keep the receipt on those to be able to return those and then people literally came out and said we have confirmed that he has not cleaned his desk out and i'm like why would we make that up like you don't think I have something? I don't have something better to do on a Sunday afternoon than report that Bill O'Brien is cleaning his desk out because he's going to take the BC job, and it's just like, but people that people are just dumb. It's like unbelievable. It's like I've got a life. Like I don't really care what Bill O'Brien does, and then it ends up yielding us Chip Kelly, which is like the greatest trade of all time. And I liked Bill O'Brien. I really did. I was excited to see him. Well, I watched every episode of Hard Knocks when he was with the Texans. It was great. But if you said we could get Chip Kelly, I I send uh bill o'brien to the gulag like tonight and he's gone and i don't care about him because we got the number one my first round number one overall draft pick in the fantasy offensive coordinator draft for ohio state with me as the athletic director is chip kelly and we got him so god bless bill o'brien i hope he enjoys uh his boston cream pie or whatever whatever else he likes to eat out there uh, i hope he enjoys uh the cape and all that other stuff but we got chip kelly so i don't even care about bill o'brien anymore but um, yeah, it just uh, it's gonna be interesting to see because you know this is like, it, it's it's like you know it's like losing Colin McCord and getting Will Howard and Julian Sand all of a sudden like they both fit in the recruiting class and Nevada like we got a lot of really good reports on Julian he was with the first team 
against the first team defense yesterday and went right down the field and was shredding our first team defense. And those are NFL guys all across the board. What's your thoughts on the ceiling of Julian Sand? Well, I think he's the best pure quarterback on the roster. I mean, just if you look at the guy that's got the highest, like, like who's going to be the guy that's the classic NFL type of thrower, the classic high draft pick in the NFL draft, it's Julian Sand. And does that make him the best college quarterback? No. Does that make him the best college quarterback right now? No. Um, but Ohio State knows what they have with him. They have to find ways to, one, keep him engaged, keep him interested, get him on the field, because the last thing you want to do is lose a guy like that and then watch him throw on for 5,000 yards somewhere else because you didn't get him on the field quick enough because you were, you know, trying to be cautious or trying to, you know, protect somebody else. So I, um, I, think, he's the, I think he's the best pure thrower on, on, the, uh, on the team. I think that's pretty much a consensus right now. But again, that doesn't make him the, the best, most ready quarterback. You know, if you ask me who's the most ready quarterback right now to play, to win, to win the national championship in 2024, that's Will Howard. You know, I, I, I want a guy with all those starts, with all that experience, um, durability. They say the best ability sometimes is availability. And, you know, Will Howard's been, been available, played through a lot of, uh, you know, tough situations with inferior talent, won a lot of huge games. So, you know, for my money as I'm sitting right now, I'm thinking it's going to go Will Howard, Julian Sane, and um, then everybody else, you know, kind of lobbies for their, their their position. I hope they all stick it out. I don't know if they will, but um, Howard and Sane is, is who I got one, two running right now, and, and we'll see. And that, and, and that doesn't – and I'm telling you, that's not a knock on Devin Brown because Devin Brown hasn't done anything wrong. It's just I think that – I think Will and Julian have kind of elevated their stuff um, to a level that, that you really have to pay attention to. And, and, and that's what I'm doing. Do you think Julian is better than Dylan Riola? Yeah. I don't think there's any question about that. I mean, I, I saw them both at the elite 11 situation, which is seven on seven doesn't mean the same thing, but it, Julian was clearly better. And I thought Dylan was really good in that competition, but I thought Julian w- was just better. And, and, and in, in gameplay, there's no comparison in, in, in gameplay. I mean, Julian Sane's a gamer. I mean, he's not a big guy, but man, he he's he's a baller. He's clutch. Um, he can move the team up and down the field. He can do a little bit of everything. Um, so yeah, I, I don't I I don't think it's particularly close between those two. Yeah, I think he's he reminds me of Quinn, like Quinn Ewers. Like he's he's a guy that's a natural thrower, wicked smart. Like that's the thing about Quinn is he was a processor, a guy that could get through full field reads like really really quickly. That's what Julian does. Like Julian is a guy. Talk to people in the Woody, man. And I mean, there's rumors that Ryan says he's the smartest guy he's ever had. Like this, this young, this early learning the playbook. Cause Ryan, again, I say this about people all the time, you know, and Ryan, you know, I know he's got the big smile and the rosy cheeks and he's a mental health advocate and all that, but like he coaches his quarterbacks really hard. Like he is very tough on quarterbacks. And for some of those guys, they crack for some of those guys, they turn into first round picks. So Julian, I think, is the next guy that's going to be the first round pick. I mean, he reminds me, of, I watched him run around and throw. He looks like Rodgers. Is that what he reminds me of? But like, and, and that's what Quinn is. Like, there's some guys that when you see him throw a football, it's just way different than everybody else. Like, I played in 09, I played with Stafford, Matt Stafford, you know, signed for $60 million as a rookie in the NFL. And I was like, how good can this guy possibly be? And we go out to practice, man, and watching the touch that this guy had on short and intermediate throws along with like the cannon that he had for the deep throws, it was like, I was like, okay, yeah, that guy's definitely worth 60 million. And you know, that was, you know, 15 years ago, but I could tell after like, you know, 15 minutes of practice, I was like, yeah, this guy's way better than any quarterback I've ever seen uh, in person uh, from a throwing perspective. And again, you know, Oh five, we played against Vince Young. Obviously I played with Troy Smith. He won the Heisman, but Matt Stafford's arm talent was crazy. And again, if you want to play for 20 years in the NFL, that's the kind of arm you got to have because that kind of arm will, you get that release where you get rid of it quick. You don't get the tar beat out of you and you're still going to get hit in football and in the NFL. But you know, when you get that release and you can process fast and get rid of the ball fast and it extends your career a long time because the guys that don't get rid of it quick, they turn into Tim couch. Like Tim couch was a guy that Bruce Arians thought was as talented as Peyton Manning, but he was on a team that was so bad 
and he got the, the tar beat out of him. And it's like, I think it's going to happen to Bryce Young. I think Bryce Young is the guy that is, you know, they signed a bunch of offensive linemen this, this year, but you know, he's a little guy and little guys get beat up and hurt. And, you know, I, I think that that's a, you better be able to get rid of it quick. And, and Julian is getting bigger. You know, he, he's a, he's a small dude. Like he looks like, he looks like a kid cause he is a kid. He's a high school senior, but you know, when you can throw it like that, no, it doesn't really matter. I mean, you can, you can launch that thing and, and he'll grow, he'll get bigger and sturdier. And, uh, but again, when you can throw it, 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 everything else is, uh, is kind of, uh, is kind of just gravy at that point. See if we have, uh, we got another super chat, Jeff Rittenhouse. Thank you for the five. Appreciate you. My friend chips misdirection gives O-line a half step advantage, massive, massive advantage for leverage getting to the second level. Jeff, you are a scholar, which is why you watch our podcast here on Buck SU, because you're a genius, because that is absolutely true. Um, the misdirection, anything that confuses the linebackers' eyes, you know, their eye discipline. You know, they gotta watch misdirection, they gotta watch the quarterback pulling the ball, they gotta watch uh, is it an RPO? Uh, you know, when that like split second goes past all of a sudden some big 310 pound guard is blocking you, you know? So if you take a false step, if you read it, that's why James preaches, I discipline, I discipline, I discipline. And, and you got to have instincts and you got to, and that's the biggest reason why you got to study a lot of film. You know, that's why, again, I talk to people all the time, James Laurinaitis and AJ Hawk were the two smartest football players and, and Nick Mangold that I played with. Th those three guys were at a different level, professor X level, X-Men, elite intelligence and it's because james was he was a film junkie he was a guy that always had his notepad was always watching tape was always studying tendencies because again like you have to get to the point where when you watch that stuff when you see it in person you know right where the ball is going like okay this guard's pulling okay this this is a down block here okay this guy's leaning this way in his stance so it's probably going to be this going to be a down block here it's going to be his own this way uh it's going to be a pass that i got to get to my drop that's what James was. And that's why James was always, he was always a hair faster than everybody else on the film because of how well he said it. Again, it wasn't, it wasn't natural talent. And again, people that are dumb, namely like NFL talent evaluators, they took a guy like Aaron Curry, who was an absolute bozo as a top five pick. And James slid to the second round because Aaron Curry ran a four, four and he weighed two fifty, and he jumped a 40 inch vertical or whatever. But you know, he couldn't, you know, he couldn't read a, you know, a cardboard box. He couldn't read a cereal box, but James Laurinaitis could read like hieroglyphics when it came to reading a football play. So, you know, again, that's what you need to evaluate. And that's what James is working to instill in guys like Sonny Styles, guys like CJ Hicks, guys, you know, Cody Simon's already, he's out at James's level, but he's the closest guy in that room. And the guy who's coming on in terms of being able to read is Gabe Powers, which is why Gabe Powers, as much as people are sleeping on him, after about three or four games, I don't think you're going to be sleeping on, on him anymore. Obviously, he's not the physical specimen that CJ or Sonny are. Um, but if you can read the stuff, then that's how you turn into like a, a Lauren. I would say it's going to be James. I mean, James was three-time All-American, two-time captain. That's gaudy. But Gabe could be a guy that plays a big role. And again, you know, Cody's gone after this year. So, you know, is it going to be CJ and, and Sonny? Is it going to be uh, Gabe Powers? I mean, Gabe Powers is going to have a big role here uh, really quick. Nevada, your thoughts, uh, Jeff Rittenhouse, uh, again, thank you for the five, uh, mentions that Chip's misdirection gives the O-line a half a step advantage, a massive advantage for leverage and getting to the second level. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, look, at every level of football, doesn't matter whether it's peewee level, junior high, high school, you know, blocking is all about angles and being able to get the proper angle on a guy. Because if you can get a guy going in the right direction and you make him just kind of ride the rail and just run him, run him out of the play, you know, those are the best blocks of all, you know, those, those ones, that, you know, the idea of just taking a guy lining up and just powered bombing him and do it, you know, how hard that is yourself. You've talked about that often. Like you line up against a big defensive player and he's going heads up against you. You're not just going to, you know, unless the guy's playing for Akron or something, you're not just going to just grab him, walk him back and throw him on the ground. You know, you're going to have to get him on an angle, get a thing and, and get him going the direction you want to go to. And far too many times for Ohio state, Ohio state, has been predictable by formation, by down, by distance. Um, and they kind of tip their hand where they're going. And so when, when the defense is slanting across your face as an offensive lineman and they're going in the direction of the ball, there's nothing you can do. You can hold them. You can grab them. 
You can try to get up. We've seen this. How many times do we see guys make plays where they line up you know, G Scott as a tight end, an offset tight end, and have the defensive end crossing, slanting across his face and expecting G Scott to make that block? And it's like, it's an impossible block to make. Nobody can make that block. And I, I think with what you're going to get with, with, uh, with Chip Kelly's offense, it's just a lot of indecision. You know, you you slant, you know, at your peril because if you slant the wrong way and he's going the other way, it's going to go for a long, long distance or they're going to hesitate in terms of doing that. And no, I think it's going to make, it's going to do wonders for the offensive line. It's already doing wonders for the offensive line. And uh, I've, I've always believed that our fundamental problems with running the football were because we it, it, they they followed us no matter we had guards playing tackles NFL players all Americans five stars three stars four it's all about scheme lack of predictability and being able to, to provide constraint whether it be with a quarterback or the other ways providing constraint and we just didn't do that enough Ryan's got an intuitive understanding of the of the passing game I I think on the running game he just hasn't been as good well Chip Kelly's the best. And so, yes, it's going to make the offensive line look better. Um, great question, great comment, and I and I think it's spot on. Yeah, I agree. And, and again, you you bring up the point about how you know you want to you know dominate the line of scrimmage, and I, I hear guys say, "Well, you know, we got to blow them all, blow them backwards. Like you got to you know you got to man block them and just drive." Them. And I'm like, I mean. Have you seen the guys we play when, like, when I'm talking about when we play good team. We play Penn State, play Michigan, play Georgia. Like, you're not just gonna like line up and single block a guy, and he just goes, you know, five yards backwards, unless he's just a fish and he stinks. But in general, like, like when we played Michigan, like, I wasn't just gonna take like Brandon Graham, who I played my senior year, and he's on like year 14 in the NFL. Like, I'm not just gonna take him and push him backwards 10 yards and. You know, you see this unified flying V of an offensive line coming off the ball and everybody's just on roller skates. Like that's not how it works. Like you got to get it. Like the, the people that got to get movement is it's the double team. There's a double team in, on the power plays and on the backside of the zone plays. That's where there's got to be some movement. And a lot of the zone stuff, you try to get guys running sideways and then you get a cut back door. Um, but that's just like, that's just reality. But the thing you can do is if you can stalemate everybody and get some misdirection and get some guys to, you know, take a false step, then all of a sudden you get creases, you get big creases. And that's, uh, that's just kind of the reality of offensive line play. Cause again, there's, there's people that are just like, well, we don't just blow everybody off the ball and knock everybody back. And we need to put all of our weight on our front hand. Like it's 19, you know, 32, you know, and you're, you're watching like, you know, like the army Navy game. And I'm like, that's just not how football is anymore. You know? And, and again, if it was, then we were playing, Youngstown State, or we're playing some team that frankly doesn't have the guys that can match up versus. But like we play real teams. Like when I played Penn State, I mean every every inch that you got, it was like a it was like a war. It was it was a fight to get every inch. It wasn't like man, watch me blow this guy backwards fifteen feet. And I did that. I I, I pancaked Tom Holly on the block block. It was the greatest block of my life. I gotta find film of it, but it was it was incredible when I did it. But you know, I think that the misdirection thing's gonna help. And as you said, running the quarterback is going to make this offensive line look way better. And then the last level, if you like, want the the the, the eight hundred level version of how to run the offense, our skill guys got to block. And I say that all the time. And it's not because I'm drinking my haterade out of my little cup. It's because literally they have to block. Like they have to take out some safeties. They have to take out some some stragglers, some corners. And again, for whatever reason, blocking isn't cool anymore. Um, and, and our, our running, our yards per carry effect, uh, it, you know, it's equally affected that the fact that our receivers refuse to block. Now, Julian Fleming would block the rest of the guys do not block. So again, I'm hoping and praying that Chip Kelly changes the attitude in that room towards that. Cause I think everybody's scared that they're made out of porcelain and they're going to get hurt if they block. But in reality, I just think it's being selfish on the football field when you don't block for your, for your dudes, when you don't block for Travion and Quinchon, I think you're just being selfish. Well, Nevada, good show. Uh, let's wrap this thing up. Any final thoughts? No, just um, excited to see what's uh, going on this week. What Chip Kelly's got it got in store for the uh, for the guys should be a, a nice week of practice. Um, said it at the beginning of the show, but want to call it out again. Dagestan Poppy, 
dude, you're the man. Great, great UFC picks yesterday. We went all in, went five for five. Uh, it's very rare that you could call your shot in gambling and then just deliver like that and sweep the board. But was uh, was very, very proud of it. And I really hope the community made money on that because we really tried to tell you that you were going to make money if you filed the action. So that was a great job by Dagestan. All right, Nevada, we've got one last super chat uh, from Herschel. Uh, thanks for being ultra man. Thanks for the deuce. Love Urban Meyer. Nick Saban is the GOAT. Is Urban on your Mount Rushmore for college football coaches? That is tough. I mean, he's got to be, right? I mean, I mean, if you're talking about the, 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 the Mount Rushmore of college football coaches, I mean, realistically, you're talking about Saban, Meyer. I mean, I mean... Yeah, I mean, when you start talking about Bud Wilkinson and Woody Hayes and other guys, I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, I'm an Ohio State guy, so Woody Hayes would be on there. Um, I mean, Bear, Bear Bryant had six rings. Yeah, Bear Bryant was pretty good too. Yeah, he was pretty good. So, I mean, I'm just so like, maybe say, say, Saban had seven, Bryant had six, Woody had five, uh, Frank Leahy had four, John McKay had four, like. You know, Urban had three, but I mean, he didn't coach nearly as long as those other guys. So, is it is it about the I'm, most rings, or is it about like who was the best in uh, a condensed period of time? You know. Yeah, no, no I'm putting Meyer on that. I'm, I'm I'm putting Meyer for his impact on the game and just his ability to win. I mean, you know, he won everywhere he went. You know, he won two at Florida. He won one at Ohio State. Had another undefeated season at Ohio State. Had another undefeated season at Utah. I mean. The guy's just, it was just a witch. So, no, Myers got Myers Sabin, Bear Bryant, Woody Hayes. Final answer. I mean, really, that's a great list. Yeah. You know, I mean, I don't like, I, again, like for like, for like, you know, Frank Leahy, you know, you know, I mean, the, winning in the 20s and the, in the forties. Like, I just, I don't think it was anywhere near as hard at Notre Dame because Notre Dame was kind of, they were college football. So it wasn't nearly as competitive as it is now. I think if you win in modern times, much, much more difficult, much, much, you know, scholarship limits. And you know, even like Woody, and again, I'm not, I'm not taking anything away from Woody. I love what he is, but like, could you imagine Urban Meyer if he didn't have scholarship limits and he could take 150 guys instead of 85 every year? Like just imagine, because not only do you have a deeper team, but you prevent all of your contemporaries from having, from fielding as good of a team, you know, because instead of taking five offensive linemen, you take 10. You know, so all those guys that end up going to Michigan or Michigan State or Purdue, they end up on your roster and a lot of them don't play, but they just kind of soak up some space, you know. So Urban Meyer <laughs> with no scholarship limits would have never lost a game, I don't think. Um, but your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I, I think it's a great point, though. It's not just so that, that you're adding your guys, it's you're keeping them from your competition. And, uh, you know, look, I'm I'm not always with the opinion that everything modern is better than the stuff in the in the past, but um, I mean, I'll, like I said, I'll I'll go to war with 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 Bear and and Woody and and Meyer and Saban and and, yeah. and, and you you can have the next four and and I think I'm I, I think my list is better. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. I thought Bobby Bowden had more, but I guess he didn't. No, he didn't he have many at all. No, yeah, he. I mean, he's not. He didn't have more than three. I mean, the other guys are, like you said, Bud Wilkinson, Pop Warner, Barry Switzer had three, Daryl Royal had three, Newt Rockney had three, Tom Osborne had three, Urban had three, Walter Camp, Howard Jones, then John McKay and frankly, he had four. So I mean, I think your list is as good as it gets. I mean, what he with five is is tremendous. So, well, Nevada, wrap this thing up again. Uh, any final thoughts, and we will get out of here. No, just uh, looking forward to this week. Going to be a fun week of Ohio State football. Uh, if you can want to do us a favor, help other people find the show, hit that like button. Hit that little thumbs up. It, the, the, hitting the like button helps trigger the algorithm with YouTube, helps other people find the show, how it lets it be recommended to them, other Ohio State fans that may not know about this, uh, this podcast. And so you can really help us out. Give us a like. Really, really appreciate it. As always, we appreciate you. I hope you guys had a great Sunday. I will let you guys get back to some March Madness uh, as we wrap up our Sunday nights. Thank you guys for tuning in. As always, we appreciate all of you. Uh, 
again, thank you uh, again for all the support on this channel. Another huge episode. It's a huge episode because you guys made it one. So thank you for that, as always. If you guys enjoy the content, please leave us a like. The likes are huge for growing this channel. Uh, and the channel is growing faster uh, than anyone in our current sector. So we appreciate that. We get the analytics uh, every month. And it is crazy how much you guys are helping us. So thank you. Uh, also, click subscribe if you have not yet. Send this to your friends, your family, anybody that loves college football or Ohio State football, uh, suggest this to them. Uh, give us uh, a little bit of a share on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Those things all help us in a huge way. And also click that little alert bell. You'll get an alert every time we go live. Shout out where you guys are watching from. Shout out who you guys are watching with, as always. And we appreciate you guys uh, spreading the good word. Uh, as always, thank you for everything you guys do to grow this channel. With that being said, Thank you so much, Buckeye Nation, and thank you, Scoop family. I'll see you guys on BuckeyeScoop.com. If you guys aren't members, it is on fire. And again, it's nonstop action on there. Scrimmage report is up. Uh, if you guys want to read it, jump on BuckeyeScoop.com. See you guys on the message boards. Have a great rest of your night. Go Bucks.